I have such a message. Okay, it's gone now. Mm. It's gone now? Okay. Yeah. So thank you for joining our panel on the progress on global UN commitments. My name is Miki Ibarra. I am a TV journalist currently in charge of Japan's NHK World Service. That's 24 hour English channel broadcast from Tokyo to the world. Let me first briefly introduce all our participants to you. We were supposed to have five panelists. At the moment, we have three. From Turkey, Mr. Ilmaz Argudin, the founder and chairman of a globally recognized management consulting firm, ARGE Consulting. He's also a leading strategist and board member of major public and private institutions. From Japan, Professor Jun Arima at the Graduate School of Public Policy, University of Tokyo. Professor Arima has been has many hats, but notably, he was the chief negotiator in the UN climate negotiation, so he knows the subject through and through. Dr. Christopher Boyejo from Nigeria. He is the executive presidential special advisor, International Organization for Economic Development. He is also national director of, for Nigeria of Indo-OIC Islamic Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Oh, hello, hello Dr. Al Sadun. Good morning. I'm facing some uh, challenges, you know, connecting to your, uh, your side. But, um, okay. But I see you now. Good. Um, good. Okay. We just started. So let me introduce you to everybody, too. Dr. Abdul Wahab Al Sadun from Saudi Arabia. He's been the Sherpa of the B20. B20 is, of course, of the Business Leaders Summit of the G20 group. He's been the Secretary General of the Gulf uh, Petrochemicals and Chemicals Association since 2009. So let me talk about a little about our uh, what we're going to discuss. World leaders agreed in 2015 on UN key targets to be met by 2030 called Sustainable Development Goals of or the SDGs. They cover a very wide range of areas of human development from zero hunger, reduced inequalities to clean energy and climate action. I'm sorry, I'm getting a call from Saudi Arabia. I'm oh, that's it, I, I think. Okay, so just cut I it think off. they are trying to convey <laughs> that we have some problem connecting. Okay, that's okay. No, we don't have any problem with them now, so. Okay, so the SDGs. This year though, the world has been under the onslaught of COVID-19. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres admitted in his address at the opening of the general uh, debate that because of COVID-19, we're careening off track in achieving the SDGs. We know it's hampering the efforts, but there must be ways to push forward. And that's what I would like each of our panelists to share with us your wisdom and guidance. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Abdul, um, Abdul Wahab Al Sadun, please start. The uh, floor is yours and I'll give you five minutes each. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mickey, uh, for your kind introduction, distinguished participants, fellow panelists. Uh, let me start by expressing my sincere gratitude for inviting me to participate in today's uh, extraordinary meeting. Um, the uh, uh, I join you in today in my capacity as the Sherba of P20 Saudi Arabia and also serve as Secretary General for GPTA, the trade negotiation advocating the common interest of the regional chemical producers. The dual role allow me to contribute to the panel not only as representative of the P20, the voice of the private sector of the P20, but also as a business leader can speak firsthand to the work done by GPCA in promoting the sustainable development of the chemical industry in the Arabian Gulf region. Our um, gathering today comes at a very interesting time. Only a couple of weeks after the UN General Assembly uh, discussed the state of the SDGs, a couple of months before the G20 Leader Summit, we will discuss it on the world economy and the measures and 10 years away from the 2030. Therefore, I, I believe this is very timely. In fact, in 2020, we are on the border of the UN Decade of Action, a decade dedicated to accelerating sustainable solutions for all 
ranging from poverty and gender to climate change, inequality, and closing the finance gap. Unfortunately, the world is far from being on track to achieve the UN SDGs by Periodic global reports, whether published by the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, or non-governmental actors such as the Sustainable Development Solution Network, underscore the need to scale up and accelerate that. While stressing the urgency, we are facing to be the SDGs. Every delay further down the cost of action. On top of this, COVID-19 pandemic has aggravated the world exposure inequalities and gaps within and among countries. In fact, some of the progress made had been reversed. A lot of development was hindered, and resources are unavailable or have been diverted to immediate relief efforts. In, in the face of this situation, the central role played by the UN system remain undisputed. The UN is needed to galvanize international and multilateral collaboration in order to make the shared universal goal of sustainable development come true. Furthermore, strengthening multilateralism coordination and collaboration at all levels of governance is, we believe, a necessary condition for active progress from the SDG. The world of business has been a vocal supporter of the SDG. It has carried through with the commitment made at the Rio Plus 20 summit in 2012, followed by its involvement in the of the SDGs and implementation of solutions to achieve their targets. The B20 Saudi Arabia recently released a report on advancing all goals of the development. That takes into consideration the fact that 17 goals and 169 targets are integrated and inseparable, balancing the economic, social, and environmental dimension of sustainable development. In our report, we advocate for an integrated approach to recommendation minimize trade-off of the SDG goal target to catch the While preparing our report, we drew a special from the past namely, people set the of nature. We also use these principles for fundamental for policy representation to the G20. As we strongly believe, G20 members should lead the way in SDGs for policy formulation ladder up to this year G23 priority, empowering people, safeguarding the planet, and which are fundamental for our goal of transforming for inclusive growth and putting we achieve the goal, the global growth by First, empowering people by unleashing opportunities for all. Many of our policy recommendations contribute to the real realization of gender equality and the empowerment of women. We call on the G20 and relevant multilateral institutions in the UN to commit to targeted and accelerated action to remove all legal, social, and economic barriers to gender equality. Second, safeguarding the planet by fostering growth within the limit of the planet. Environment is an underlying aspect. We call on the G20 members to commit to achieve carbon neutrality and accelerate implementation for this group. Now is the time for countries to speak and financially not able to transfer the economies towards carbon neutrality. Motion of cleaner and more sustainable energy systems is the alongside the strengthening of climate resilience and a real transition to circular economy. And last but not shaping a new frontier by enabling an even adoption of political advances and Digitalization is an enabler for change as it helps directly or indirectly every development of work. in order to enable an even penetration of distribution of equal recruitment and digital process. I think digital recruitment and grow digital and opening digital divide supporting the development of artificial intelligence and Further, enhancing a culture of high integrity of G20 to contribute to enhance the rule of law and trust in institutions, as well as economic opportunities for all. G20 call on the G20 to pursue the, the culture of high integrity in public and private sector, leveraging emerging technologies to manage risk 
relating to corruption and fraud and enhance integrity and transparency in public procurement. To conclude, allow me to reiterate the B20 commitment to international cooperation and multilateralism and its support to a stronger United Nations. This pandemic crisis is the time to accelerate and recover the lost progress on SDGs, not divert attention and resources from them. We, the private sector, are ready to collaborate and help government implement policies to build back better. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you so much, Dr. Al uh, Al-Sadun. Uh, so next, uh, Mr. Argudin, please, you have a floor. Thank you very much, Mickey. Uh, it's a great pleasure to share uh, this platform uh, with such leaders who are concerned about the future of the world. I'm uh, happy to work uh, with Dr. al uh, on the B20 as well, because we ca uh, my company contributes to that uh, activity also. Uh, let me briefly mention uh, that uh, there are a couple of problems uh, with the way we are approaching the SDGs. Uh, one of them uh, is that uh, we cannot meet them only by government efforts. We need the uh, NGOs, we need the company side and so forth. And only that there are very good leaders who fully understand the importance of this for the survivability of the humankind. However, uh, unless we can bring this understanding to scale, we are not going to make a difference either. So there's a big problem about bringing it to scale. There are great leaders who are focused on this, but not enough. Okay. Uh, we, we have... Uh, a, a foundation called Argentine Governance Academy, and we did a global research of over 200 global sustainability leaders. What I mean by this is that uh, these are companies who made it to the sustainability indices of major stock exchanges around the world. So these are supposedly great companies. And when we look at them, we evaluate how they provide governance to sustainability issues. Is it only reporting what you do or are you really taking it seriously and what kind of review mechanisms and so forth are you providing to your sustainability efforts? Because you provide good governance to your financial efforts about your sustainability efforts. That's what we are trying to check. And one of the things that we see is that even among these 200 global leaders, uh, over a quarter do not even map SDGs with what they are doing. And these are among the, I mean, they are in the sustainability indices of their relevant uh, stock exchanges. And when you look at whether or not they report uh, any results based on SDGs in their sustainable reports, annual reports, integrated reports, whatever, it is less than 60%, 59% to be exact. So 40% of the global le leaders are not reporting what they are doing about uh, or what they are achieving with regards to SDGs. When we carry it even further, uh, are they reporting any targets that they want to meet? These percentages become much less, okay? So at this time, we can say even the leaders, global leaders who carry about, uh, who worry about this sustainability issues, do a matching effort in reporting what we do, how does it report, match with a particular SDG, and maybe report that. And the majority of them, not majority, but significant part of them even don't do that. When we, if we consider that to make a difference, we need to look at the whole value chain, all potential impact that you can influence, and put targets and follow that through, even these global sustainability leaders, uh, the percentage of companies who are doing this is very low. So uh, I would uh, highly recommend uh, looking at our uh, website in this area because we, the only reason we are doing this research is to speed up peer learning. There are very good examples. There are companies who appoint their board members based on their sustainability skills, at least a couple of them, which is very important for the board to review this, what they are doing and so forth. So we try to identify those good examples, share them publicly, 
so that peer learning will speed up. Okay, so this is one idea that I wanted to share. Do we have a second round? Um, yes, yes, I'll come back to you if that's okay. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a second idea in the second yeah. round. Yes, yes, so, that's uh, very, very interesting. What I'm saying is that to, for, for us to understand whether or not the relevant parties fully embrace uh, what they can do with uh, the SDGs, they have to focus on them, they have to, we have to provide incentives, their uh, executive compensation has to be linked to it, their targets have to be uh, shared publicly, what they achieve and what they cannot achieve should be shared publicly so that they can take remedies to speed up uh, what they can do and we should improve the opportunities for global peer learning from good examples. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'll come back to you for the second, second point. Uh, Professor Arima. Uh, thank you, Miki. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, since I was a former negotiator in the UN climate talks, I'd like to talk about 1.5, 2 degrees target under the Paris Agreement. And at first, uh, you know, there is a huge gap between the Paris temperature target and the real world. 1.5 degree target calls for global carbon neutrality in 2050. On the other hand, uh, compilation of current national targets under the Paris Agreement will result in increase of green, greenhouse gas emissions uh, towards 2030 and beyond. Yes, uh, lockdowns and economic downturns caused by COVID-19 are reducing CO2 emissions for now, but emissions are most likely to rebound in accordance with economic recovery. In China, for example, SOX, NOx, PM2.5 and CO2 emissions are already rebounding. And UN Secretary General and Ms. Greta Thunberg are pushing countries to scale up their level of ambition. However, I'm rather skeptical uh, whether such a political advocacy will be a meaningful outcome. Uh, this leads to my second point. My second point is that climate change is one of the 17 SDGs, not the supreme one above all the others. Priority among 17 SDGs is different from country to country depending on their development stage. Moreover, uh, there is a synergy and trade-off among them. Uh, climate action must be the highest priority in Sweden, for example, but it will not be the case in developing countries. According to the UN global poll, uh, global poll uh, called My World, uh, highest priority was given uh, to job, healthcare, and education, and priority for climate change was much below. And all of these require robust economic growth and are underpinned by affordable energy and reliable supply. And ambitious climate action quite often leads to higher energy cost, at least for the time being. If renewable has become such cheap in all the markets, all of the countries will naturally switch to renewable, but it is not yet happening because renewable energy needs to be supported by heavy subsidies and intermittent renewables entail system integration cost. So as we have witnessed in Yellow Vest movement, uh, raising energy cost is one of the most unpopular policies in many countries. So this will be particularly the case under the current economic recession amid COVID-19. So it is not surprising that governments are preoccupied with the economic recovery and job creation rather than long-term climate actions. So my third point is climate change is a typical example of prisoner's dilemma. While the benefit from ambitious climate actions by a certain country is globally shared, the cost of ambitious actions must be borne by the country alone. Unilaterally ambitious climate actions could cause carbon leakage and damage domestic industries and jobs. So that is why the EU is considering carbon border adjustment measures but a this could trigger trade war, and also calculation of carbon contents is also technically very, very difficult uh, for products going through global supply chain. So what can we do under such cul-de-sac? Uh, that leads to my fourth point. My fourth point is that only solution uh, for simultaneous achievement of economic growth and climate mitigation is to develop innovative technologies, such as high performance renewables or battery, next generation nuclear, hydrogen, and the CCUS. In addition, uh, such technologies must be affordable so that uh, they could be widely deployed in developing countries where 
the bulk of incremental greenhouse gas emissions will come to the future. So rather than competing in announcement of sexy emission targets, uh, countries should cooperate for developing such technologies by setting technology targets uh, for higher efficiency, better performance, and lower cost through collaborative research, development, demonstration, and deployment. Such technology-oriented approach is much more pragmatic, pragmatic than traditional emission target approach. So my final point is that we should not obsess with uh, so-called climate fundamentalism. In the past human history, uh, fundamentalism never did good for us, and it won't be uh, in the future. Ongoing stigmatization of fossil fuels, particularly coal, uh, simply neglects uh, the energy reality in Asian region, where high dependence on fossil fuel will continue for several decades. So we should acknowledge that energy transition uh, could take different pathways based on each country's specific circumstances. So what we need now is pragmatism underpinned by reality, not a hollow advocacy. So that's all mm -hmm. uh, what I do to say now. Thank you, Miki. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so we seem to have lost uh, Dr. Boyejo, but I hope I hope you will come back to our panel. And um, so, listening to you, uh, Professor Arima, uh, you emphasized on innovative technologies. In developing that, I think it's not only the government who could do that, but the collaboration between governments and private sectors yeah. would be very, very important. What do you think of that, gentlemen? Yeah, and um, uh, that is. Can, can I answer to your question? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, you are uh, absolutely right. And then in particular, innovative technology entails a lot of risk. And uh, under the current economically challenging situation, uh, many private sectors uh, may have lost uh, their, how can I say, energy uh, for mm -hmm. spending a lot of money for uh, such a high risk technologies. So mm -hmm. I think uh, government should prepare a neighboring environment. Uh, for private mm -hmm. sectors, so that uh, they can spend, uh, you know, large chunk of money uh, for research and development, and also mm -hmm. government should take a lead uh, in spending R&D budget, uh, so that uh, they can collaborate uh, with private sectors. So I think mm -hmm. uh, such a you know, public-private partnership is even more important under this mm -hmm. uh, challenging economic situation amid and after COVID-19. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Dr. al you mentioned about digitalization, accelerating digitalization uh, would be very important, but what must be an important point we should not miss in terms of that, um, you know, if there is anything that's hampering accelerating digitalization in, in countries? What's your well, point? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Miki, once again. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, digitalization has a profound impact on uh, communities, markets, and governments like, uh, as we have seen with the COVID-19 crisis, you know, it has allowed businesses to continue to, to operate and people to learn and work as well from uh, home. Mm -hmm. But as adoption has accelerated communities, we must bear in mind that, you know, 50% of the world population does not currently participate in the digital economy at all. I see. Uh, okay, so what? Uh, Sorry, can I carry yes, on? Yes, please. Okay. Yes. So G G twenty countries, uh, in, in our opinion, need to prioritize bridging the digital divide. Uh, it can do so by investing in the necessary infrastructure and grow digital skills through innovative methods for digital education, for mm -hmm. instance and for providing more digital job opportunities, in particular uh, uh, to women. Uh, uh, furthermore, you know, uh, fully in the digital economy will require, in our opinion, a uh, joint effort with individual, uh, the MSMEs, uh, the businesses, and government, as the previous uh, panelist had alluded at. Mm -hmm. Truly must adopt a principle that foster an ecosystem of trust and innovation as well. Mm -hmm. You know, this includes the promoting uh, recommended uh, minimum common international cybersecurity standard mm -hmm. in collaboration with industry-based practices and provide some incentives 
for mm -hmm. businesses demonstrating cybersecurity uh, readiness. And, um, lastly, we need you know the G20 members to uh, set the regulatory foundation, and boost investment to reduce connectivity gaps, and ensure the most global value chain for technology, and incentivize afford affordable digital access via services, network, and devices. We believe these are critical steps to help drive digital transformation and ensure a more sustainable and inclusive Back to you, Mickey. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Well, um, from London, Mr. Konstantin Dobrynin just joined us. Welcome. Uh, hi, uh, dear friend. Yes, Hello. I'd like to introduce... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm laughing because I, I was trying to break through the system to this conference about, about three three hours. I think it is a record. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, now, now you have done it, so welcome. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, Mr. Dobrynin is a former senator of the Russian Parliament State Secretary and Federal Chamber of Lawyers of Russia. Currently, he is senior partner of Russian law firm Pen Paper. And so I would like to give you floor for five minutes on the... Yes, uh, our thank, theme. You. thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll try to be fast, try not to be so <laughs> boring, you know, as all we lawyers uh, usually do. So firstly, I'd like to say thank you. I'm really, uh, I'm really honored to be here with you, my friend. So, and uh, I just uh, try to speak about some uh, climate emergency and the global warning and, and those commitments which Russia undertook by signing, you know, the Paris Agreement within the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll try to to give uh, your brief opinion from the, my point of view as an advocate as, and as a former legislator, because, you know, it's a big difference between attitude, us, the people of law, uh, to such a big challenge as the climate emergency and uh, between the government. And, uh, you know, uh, in Russia, there seems to be little awareness of the importance of those commitments, as well as a li little actual concern about climate changing. Uh, yes, uh, my country did join the Paris Agreement by making a government regulation to that effect. It's uh, happened, uh, I think, years ago. And uh, Russia even approved a national roadmap until 2022, which is intended to mitigate the consequences of climate change for Russia's national security, econo economy, and population. But uh, those steps are uh, largely formalistic, and the real understanding of the climate problem in Russia is still to come. Specifically, the national roadmap I have just mentioned claims to lay down the institutional and the organizational foundation of the government to respond to climate change. In fact, though, it seems to have been prepared with the sole purpose of showing Russia's formal uh, compliance with international obligations, mm -hmm. and it will, handle, it will hardly serve a vehicle of any considerable progress. And um, all this, I mean, this uh, formal legislation step, they sounds uh, ambitious, uh, but uh, the real situation is not so good as it is. Uh, However, never, neither the Paris Agreement uh, nor Russia's national regulations made under that agreement set out any mechanism whatsoever to control and enforce compliance, mm -hmm. specifically the right of uh, international experts to review the information on CO2 emissions provided by national governments. It's the only control of Paris Agreement has to offer. This all means that the legal provisions of the Paris Agreement are only declarations of general principles which are intentionally devoid of any specific legal mechanism that would ensure effective implementation of those principles in the real world. It means that, yes, we have legal declaration, but we don't have our internal proper legal legislations mm -hmm. to implement this declaration. So from the formal uh, side, it looks nice, but from the real side, when you uh, 
trying to find some legal mechanism, you couldn't find them. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what else? Uh, I think, um, and it's not, it's not only the problem of government, because uh, uh, the second problem is that big corporations, I mean, big industry in Russia, uh, tend to comply with legal requirements only where the subject to rigid controls mm-hmm. and where not compliance car- carries substantial liability. Mm-hmm. For instance, uh, uh, it could be administrative liability or even criminal liability. <laughs> of course, yes, there's, uh, there's some exceptions. Mm-hmm. For instance, some big pulp and paper industries, they do uh, made uh, a lot of innovations, uh, and whatever, but as you maybe you have heard about uh, recently accident in Nornickels, it's a big Russian mining company which caused a large fuel spill and re- mm. and resulted uh, in an environmental disaster in Siberia. And this accident demonstrates that not all leading industrial companies are ready to operate in an environmental responsible manner. So, you know trying to uh, answer about the progress, Mm -hmm. I would like uh, to say that the key factor of progress is people. And uh, even, I mean, people, people mind. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if, I mean, like normal people would uh, understand that all these issues are real, Mm-hmm. that the government should uh, really cares about it. Right. And only right. after that, uh, real uh, legislation, regulations would come over, not mm-hmm. before. Mm-hmm. Before, we all will have a look to these beautiful, you know, round tables, uh, right. some uh, nice talk uh, on mm-hmm. the conference uh, where, uh, you know, I-, I was a senator. I remember right. how it was. And, uh, you know, all this climate changing, all these ecological problems, they were not in a real focus of legislation attempt, uh, mm-hmm. attention and from uh, the attention of the government. Mm-hmm. It was a form. It was a nice form where everybody could speak about it. Right. So before... Okay. We Thank should, you. Uh, change the um, mind, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So changing the mind um, is exactly what I think uh, Mr. Argudin was talking about. Um, a lot of uh, big top leaders of the corporates didn't even know about um, or didn't really prioritize of the yeah. SDG goal, right? Um, yes. So you tell us, tell us a second point. What private? Now, now I'd like to make a second suggestion. So yeah. first was to learn mm-hmm. from the best examples. Sure. Uh, as much as possible to speed up mm-hmm. global learning. Mm-hmm. Second, to attract attention to SDGs, SDG by SDG. Mm-hmm. Because when you say SDGs, it becomes too cumbersome. There are 17 SDGs, mm-hmm. 169 KPIs. Right. When you put it in front of a leader, it's very difficult to identify. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, they have a lot of responsibilities, business, and right. you have 169 things that come to you. Mm-hmm. It is not very easy for people to focus on. We, right. However, without focus, we cannot make a change. So mm-hmm. we need focus. Mm-hmm. My, uh, my second recommendation is to have a calendar day for each SDG. For mm-hmm. example, SDG 8, Women's Day, whatever. Mm-hmm. There are mm-hmm. lots, I mean, lots of uh, global days uh, right. around. Mm-hmm. In those particular days, let's try to bring the government's the NGOs and the corporates who are really paying attention to that particular SDG mm-hmm. together to review first uh, content, where we are in globally, according mm-hmm. to that SDG, according to its KPIs and so forth. Right. And then what works, who, is imp- who has improved in the last couple of years most, what mm-hmm. did they do? Okay. And uh, also, uh, how can we learn from these good examples, either individually or mm-hmm. system-wide? For example, our colleague from Russia said that may, maybe we should do some legislation, some regulation. Those mm-hmm. who did regulation, are they improving, fast, are improving faster? Whatever. SDG mm-hmm. by SDG, 
because people's focus are different. When we looked at the uh, other uh, analysis that I mentioned earlier of over 200 companies, we see that for SDGs, everybody says they are doing something. But there are SDGs such as 16, which is good governance. Mm -hmm. uh, lowest percentage of companies who are embracing that uh, SDG is on number 16. Mm -hmm. Also, companies are not embracing poverty, one, two, as well as, uh, uh, for example, life under, in, under the ocean. These seem a bit more difficult for companies. Mm -hmm. So we can, this way, attract attention to each SDG because all of them are important for the world. Right. Uh, so my second suggestion is to assign an SDG a, a calendar day. And mm -hmm. on that day, try to promote collaboration, try to identify state of the world, try to identify progress and the gap so that we can uh, entice uh, peer learning again around the world uh, for that particular SDG. Mm -hmm. uh, this particular argument is put forward. I uh, gave a, a short uh, presentation. I provided the link so mm -hmm. that it will not fly. You can take a look at it as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Al Sadun, you also mentioned about the importance of multilateralism in this age. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more about that? How could we, how could we, you know, let multilateralism gain momentum again in this, you know, atmosphere of the world? Well, uh, you know, this is a very critical uh, uh, issue. We believe as uh, private sectors that, um, you know, uh, reforming the multilateralism, multilateral institutions, <coughs> Uh, you know, uh, through a reform process would uh, reflect positively on the performance of the uh, uh, global economy. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, there are, you know, several uh, priorities that uh, had alluded at earlier, uh, you know, for, for the recommendation to be considered by uh, the G20 and put forward. Um, among them is, you know, empowering, you know, people, uh, and, and specifically the women, uh, and uh, uh, bearing in mind that the challenges, you know, to save our uh, planet, you know, we believe that, uh, you know, it's the, the right time for the countries to be the regulatory and financial policy framework mm -hmm. uh, to transform, uh, you know, toward uh, uh, the carbon neutrality. Um, and... Uh, also, as outlined earlier by uh, the previous uh, colleagues, we believe that you know technological advance advancement is critical, especially mm -hmm. um, especially during this uh, you know crisis that had uh, you know created by the uh, pandemic. And uh, as as the B20, we are committed to international cooperation and multilateralism. And uh, it's support to, we, we do support also a stronger United Nations uh, to champion the uh, uh, cause of the uh, SDGs. Timur. And we strongly believe that now is the time to accelerate and recover the lost progress, you know, due to the uh, pandemic crisis. And we are uh, committed as a private sector to collaborate with the government, mm -hmm. you know, to to implement, to formulate and implement, you know, the right policies to build back. Uh, but this is our uh, pledge and commitment, you know, to uh, to address the challenge that we are encountering at this. Great, thank you. Now we only have five minutes, so I would like each of you to uh, give us the last word on how we can push forward to a better world. Um, Professor Arima first. Uh, yes, um, you know, say inspired by the comment by Dr. Arsadun, uh, I believe in the multilateralism, but uh, multilateralism is not only, how can I say, uh, embodied in United Nations. I think uh, we could also consider, say, bilateral cooperation or plurilateral cooperation or something. 
in particular for technology innovation, uh, perhaps we could consider coalition with the willing uh, of the countries which has a capacity uh, for developing innovative technology. We don't need to have 160 countries participation because that is sometimes very much cumbersome. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, for tackling a uh, global agenda, uh, we should also embrace uh, some sort of regime complex uh, that's a multi-layer uh, type mm -hmm. of cooperation. Uh, on one mm -hmm. hand, UN, on the other hand, bilateral, plurilateral, or trilateral, mm -hmm. and so on. So uh, we need to try all the options. So that's all I'd like to say now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I Thank think uh, we can only uh, improve what we measure. <clears throat> so we need to measure, share, and incentivize good examples and also learning. Mm -hmm. uh, peer learning is the best way to improve the world. Thank you. Mr. Dobrin. Uh You know, I think my answer would be like quite quite obvious. I think the main uh, the main key is the legal education of uh, our people. Because, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. legal education, like in a general meaning. So, because the people don't know their rights, they don't know how to protect their rights. They even don't the normal mechanism of protecting their rights. So, the mm -hmm. like edu legal education of uh, our uh, citizen, it is the main. But it's like mm -hmm. three parts of this. First is government. Second is big business. I mean, big business, mm -hmm. because big business could show the example. And then third part is uh, like people. If this uh, triple would uh, like come together, we could be in a progress. Without that, I think uh, no chance. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. al Sadin, your last words. Well, uh, in, in brief, I would like to emphasize on the need for strengthening multilateralism, coordination, and, and collaboration at all level of uh, governance. Uh, mm -hmm. This is uh, a necessary condition for uh, accelerated progress on the uh, SDGs. And we believe uh, the UN have a central role to be played in, in this uh, uh, mechanism. So uh, uh, we as a B20 business community are committed you know, to uh, work with the government, with all the stakeholders, to make this uh, coming to Thank you so much. So it, the system says we have 30 seconds to go. Um, so even though COVID-19 is will most likely continue for some time, but we must not lose sight of what collective efforts the international community has been making for decades and what we need to achieve. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. バイバイ。バイバイ。バイバイ。バイバイ。バイバイ。バイバイ。バイバイ。バイバイ。バイバイ。バイバイ。バイバイ。バイバイ。バイバイ。バイバイ。バイバイ。バイバイ。バイバイ